Okay, so next up we have Dr. Mark Post, who's gonna come talk to us about Enviro Meat. Anyone? Now let's talk about this. Um, vitro, in vitro meat, sorry. Where is Mark? Hi, come on up, Mark. So that's a difficult act to follow. Um, the, um, so we have, we've heard uh, a number of uh, issues with, with innovation, um, also sort of serendipity and, and accidents, and I'm actually uh, a medical doctor by training, so I'm the, the fourth person in line that's not from the food industry. And maybe there's a story here to tell that uh, the real innovations usually come from the outside and not from inside of the, uh, of the industry, but I will come back to that uh, later. So my biggest problem was um, that uh, food security is threatened basically by uh, livestock. 70% um, of all our agricultural uh, pro uh, uh, produce goes to feeding animals instead of feeding people. Um, and it is because these are inefficient um, uh, creatures to um, serve as food for our, um, uh, for our population. So for every 15 grams of meat, you have to enter 100 grams of vegetable proteins into a cow, for instance. So we run into issues with um, food production because we are keeping uh, livestock production as a source for our beef. And it's actually better explained by uh, the people in this uh, video if it starts working. Do we have sound? Without sound, it's pretty useless. Then we could get right. lots of energy, and that energy enabled us to have bones <coughs> and become physically, anatomically human. Hunters and gatherers all over the world are very sad if, for a few days at a time, the hunters come back empty-handed. The camp becomes quiet, the dancing stops, and then somebody catches some meat, they bring the prey into the camp, or nowadays into somebody's back garden with a barbecue, everybody gets excited to come and share the meat. It is ritually cut and passed out to people. We are a species designed to love meat. Feeding the world is a complex problem. I think people don't yet realize what an impact meat consumption has on the planet. 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from meat production. We're also using something like 1,500 gallons of water to produce just one pound of meat. Meat takes up about 70% of our arable lands. There's no question that if we were able to shift more of our land into intensive fruit and vegetable production, we'd be able to feed a lot more people a lot healthier diet. With the global population growing from 7 billion to 9 billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat will double. We can't just continue doing what we've been doing. Unless we make some changes in how we produce meat on this planet, we're in for a terrible reckoning. Meat consumption was part of the human species. It's been fantastically beneficial for us. And now, by some horrendous irony, it's become part of a system that threatens our species. We have to do something about it. So there are two arguments here. One is that um, we are a species designed to eat meat. Um, that may be uh, contested, uh, but when I look to myself I, and I know all the problems with meat production, I still eat meat. Who of you is vegetarian? So it's about 3-5%, um, which is the average in industrialized countries, and that number hasn't really increased in the last 35 years. So there's something in us that craves for meat, which is you know, okay, but um, since our production system now meets its, um, its boundaries, we have to come up with a, a solution. Uh, and the second is that there is an environmental concern. And that's really huge, that environmental concern, because livestock really is responsible for 20% of our greenhouse gas emission. Um, that's usually uh, methane, mostly methane, and it's, um, it differs from, of course, from which livestock you are talking about. But it's, it's a tremendous uh, contribution. So if we can solve that problem, um, we have a good, um, a good opportunity to um, uh, do something good about the planet. 
So, you know, there is an alternative. We can all become vegetarian. And if you look at this pile, it looks very, very appetizing. Um, and it's very rich in protein. And actually, 20% of the world population is vegetarian. And they thrive and they uh, procreate. Um, so there's not an issue with health um, uh, of a vegetarian diet. Uh, we don't need meat. Yet, we like it. So um, uh, it's not likely to happen that um, uh, the whole world becomes a vegetarian, even when we realize that we get sufficient proteins from those sources. And maybe, uh, and it may even be healthier. Those are not arguments. And what's more, the uh, increase in meat consumption is not coming from the industrialized countries, it's coming from the growing middle class in uh, BRIC countries, uh, India, China, uh, and also Russia. Um, strangely enough, not from South America. So we have to convince these people, who for the first time in their lives can uh, afford meat, to refrain from something that we have been doing for the last 13,000 years. Um, which is a, really a difficult uh, proposition. So, uh, what about technology? Can technology then uh, provide a solution to, uh, uh, to this problem? And um, I think it can. Uh, that's that's my, my opinion. So, the technology that we are proposing is actually very, very simple. Um, every muscle of every mammalian, uh, but also every vertebrate, has stem cells in it. They are sitting there waiting to repair tissue in case of injury, and they grow muscle um, if it's lost. So, you can use these cells, you can take these cells out through a harmless procedure, if you like, and keep the cow alive in this case. Um, you can take them out. Um, they have the, you, you get a, a small piece of muscle, animal lives, uh, consists of muscle cells and also of fat cells, and then uh, these stem cells still have the capacity to grow, um, to multiply, um, to um, 10 to the 14 cells, if you like, theoretically. That's 10,000 kilos of meat, by the way, from one single cell. Um, so they can multiply and they can uh, merge into skeletal muscle cells, become a sort of a primitive muscle cell, and then when you grow them in certain conditions, and we don't really have to do a whole lot about that. The cells do that by themselves. They grow into a muscle tissue, a muscle ring in this case. Um, and that will, if you have 15,000 of those muscle fibers, you basically have a hamburger. Um, and we decided at some point to create such a product um, for reasons that I will uh, come back later. So this is um, what it looks like. Uh, we have presented this August 5th for the international uh, press. Um, uh, also because we needed to uh, start the discussion on um, the issues with livestock uh, beef production or beef production in general. Uh, and we at the same time want to show, well, here's a technology, we can do this. Um, we still need to work on it a, lit, uh, uh, a bit, but uh, we can do it and it can the theoretically provide a solution to that problem. Of course, we couldn't get around having a couple of people eat it and taste it, uh, because for the last two years that was always the second question that journalists ask me, you know, have you eaten it and how does it taste? Um, but this wasn't really the... The, the key point of the presentation, the key point was we can do this and um, uh, we need to um, start working on it. And of course, one of the issues, and I think also one of the issues with funding initially, that there was this sense nobody is going to eat this. Um, from a lab, a Frankenburger, lab chops, um, whatever, all sorts of horrible names came up, uh, because there was this association with something high high-tech and converting one of the quote-unquote last natural sources of food, turn that into a high-tech environment where people can mess with it. So, one of the amazing outcomes actually of that presentation was that 63% um, uh, of the Dutch people across a cross-section of the population um, responded to the question, are you willing to try this, and if, it, if it's okay, do you want to eat it? They said yes. So that's 63%. That was an amazing number. And The Guardian, just after the London presentation, did a poll among uh, um, uh, English people, and 68% immediately after the presentation said, yes, this seems like a good idea, and yes, we want to taste it. So the whole fear factor 
seems to disappear very, very quickly and people would like to eat it. So we became a little bit more bold and thought about, well, how can you be creative in this sense? How can you make it more fun? Because things need to be fun, of course. Um, and um, you can create um, mixed products. You can create, for instance, a, um, a slurry from, um, uh, from a surf and turf slurry, if you like, by just combining the cells. Not by genetic modification, but by combining the cells, you can um, have a, uh, a uh, woolen uh, rabbit leg or a uh, flaming uh, giraffe uh, burger or a uh, mythological uh, steak, right? You can create all these uh, products. It's just to get the imagination going where you can go from here. And um, maybe even more importantly, you can create healthy meats. Um, currently, it has no fat, which is an issue, I think, uh, so we, we are creating fat for it. Um, but you can, you can coerce these fat cells, and it, it can be done very easily with uh, feeding the appropriate um, stuff. Uh, you can coerce these fat cells into make it, making omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Um, so you can make a healthy burger that actually lowers your cholesterol instead of increasing your cholesterol, and maybe it's by some stroke of luck as a physician I can prescribe at some point hamburgers, which would be a conflict of interest, but it's, uh, um, <laughs> that was not the intention of it. So, um, we feel that this is, uh, you know, the technology is not ready yet for uh, marketing. Uh, we still need to do a lot of work. Uh, one of the great, I think, um, uh, messages with uh, this hamburger that it, that it costs 250,000 euro, which is arguably uh, expensive, um, and we made three of them, so we burned in a very small period of time 750,000 euro. Um, which will I come back to later. But the, um, the, the, the point is that that sort of illustrates that it's not a product yet, that we do a lot of work, um, but it can be done. Um, I believe we can eventually make it cost efficient and even more importantly, resource efficient. Um, and then it will solve a huge problem with livestock food production. So, uh, the organizers asked me to, um, I'm running out of time, so I'll be very brief about this, but how to, how to realize your ideas, because this was an idea, it was actually an old idea, and my sort of humble contribution was that um, I, I took it into practice. So um, I finally said, well, this is what we should do. We have the medical technologies, we can create this, and let's just do it, and, um, and don't worry about it too much. Um, but of course, you have um, uh, most of the ideas that you come up with, um, and, and you wonder, how am I going to realize this? Well, first, you have a brilliant idea. Brilliant ideas are very, very easy to get. Um, uh, that's not really the problem. You, the, the problem is how do you convince other people that these are brilliant ideas. Um, one of the best examples of a brilliant idea, I don't know whether you know these, are these bags filled with air um, that um, um, take up space in a box if it's shipped instead of all these crumbled little uh, foamy things. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a very simple and brilliant idea. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always amazed. You know, how do people come at these ideas and then and then market it? Because it's it's absolutely brilliant and it solves a tremendous number of problems. Now those pro ideas are apparently difficult to come by because they are so easy. Um, uh, but then, of course, you need to be able to convince other people, and that's where it, um, it gets um, a, a little bit more difficult. Um, so you have to have guts, and, and we heard it before, some people change careers. I changed career from sort of a, a highbrow medical um, researcher to a hamburger guy, um, and it's, it's scary. It's scary to do that, but it's um, something if you believe that this is necessary, then you just go for it. Um, so it's, um, you have the guts to go for funding. Um, the best way of not getting funding is not asking for it. Um, so you just go out there and ask for it, and you talk a lot about your ideas, and you never know how you eventually are going to get it. I got it through the media, basically. Um, at some point, Sergey Brin came to me and said, well, I, I hear you, what you're doing, I like the idea, uh, let's give you some money. Um, and then you also have the guts to spend money, because I really see a lot of people in my environment who eventually get funding and then are sort of afraid, you know, how am I going to uh, do this, and I have this responsibility, and, um, 
And I, I've shown you with the 750,000 for three hamburgers that um, I apparently don't lack that type of uh, guts. And you have to have a healthy disregard for the impossible. I love that quote. It's actually from Sergey Brin, as, as far as I know. He probably has it from somebody else. But um, I, I think that's a key message. Um, because a lot of people told me um, who are in cell culture and uh, tissue culture as, as we are, uh, you know, this is just impossible. This is the, the least efficient technique ever. Uh, it's never going to happen. And now they are changing their minds and say, well, you know, well, we don't know yet. Um, so you have to have a healthy disregard for the impossible. Um, and finally, you have to realize that people who have money are people. They are humans. So um, if you can, uh, and, and I tend to think that they, that they think the same way like we do. The only difference is they have the money and you want it. Um, so you can figure out what kind of arguments you need to convince them to give you the money. Because they are basically consumers just like us. They just consume different things. Um, and if you can, so I, I usually what I do with any different, with any, any kind of project, I try to imagine as a funder, what would I want to know? What would I want to hear and feel to give that person the money for that um, uh, project? And I think it's a very simple rule that I live by, and for the last 25 years, um, uh, I got, um, I, I guess that was the reason why the organizers asked me, I have somewhere in my CV that I got 30,000 million uh, dollars over the last 20 years for my ideas in medical research, and yesterday I added another three and a half million to it. Um, but that's because I, that's one of the, the very simple rules that I live by. You know, I, I try to imagine um, sitting in the seat of a, a funder with money, what, what do I want to hear from somebody to uh, be able to give them uh, this money? So that's my sort of final uh, message, and I thank you for your attention.